Hey guys, welcome back to episode 15 of the Harbor Site. And finally, I've got here uh, Mel Chansey. And man, dude, it took us, uh, this is like try three. Yes, yeah, the third try for sure. Mel Chansey is such a big deal. I had to actually come to <laughs> Boca to, to to do a podcast with him. Let's tell the, could we, I tell the story yeah, real quick. Yeah, so yeah. we were supposed to come by you uh, probably, what, four or five months ago? It was, yeah, it was last uh, year. I think it was last year. Last year, year. Yeah. okay. And then Sid's wife, Jax, got sick. Right. So we had tap out. That's the, what it was. The, yeah, 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 we yeah. tapped out literally yeah. hours before we were getting on the flight, right? And uh, so then we were coming um, January, January something. Yeah, the end of January. Yeah. I got sick. Yeah. <laughs> I got the <laughs> mumble that was going around, and uh, we had to tap out to come up by you. So yeah. this is this is this the third try. <laughs> Finally, Sid was just like, you know what? We're, we're just come down here. I'm, I'm booking a studio. Let's do it. So it's it's a little bit different, but this is yeah, this, this is, is a nice, nice spot in Boca. Yeah. The weather's great. The and, weather's uh, great, man. It's dreary up in North Carolina right now. Yeah, and we got to hang for the last 48 hours. Right? Yeah, it's awesome. It's been good, man. Yeah. So. Mr. Mel Chansey, there's a lot of stuff that we can, we'll have to we'll tap dance around if we need to, and we can edit it out. But uh, you've got quite the story, and not only that, but you've got quite the future. Yeah, yeah, man. So, so real quick, give me the the top level, like where are you from, and uh, and give me the a little bit of the childhood aspect where you grew up. So I was born and raised in a suburb of Chicago, uh, uh, in Illinois, uh, a town called Elsup, and. Uh, it's crazy because <clears throat> I have the the cleaver life, right? The mom and dad. My dad was a hard worker all his life. My yeah. mom ran the the little league, the ran the bank, and uh, you know my mom and dad were very um, no, you know, known in the in the community, right, with the kids and the and everything they did. My dad was my baseball coach growing up and everything, and. Uh, my two sisters went to Catholic school. It's two sisters and me, you know. So I was raised in that, you know, the the white picket fence, Beaver Cleaver house, and. Uh, <clears throat> As I grew up and stuff and, you know, started, you know, like in like motorcycles, I had dirt bikes and everything. And uh, so the story goes is there was a little gym by my house and it was a, a pay 10 bucks a month. You got a key and it was a real small, you know, it was a it had oh, concrete, man, old school, old gym. school, concrete yeah. weights, sore covers and stuff to put on the bars. It was an old school gym and it was called Jay's. And I happened to be. Um, is it still there? No, no. no. You know, everything got developed around it. Oh, okay. <clears throat> People sold the house that had it. It was a guy that had it in his backyard. And uh, I happened to be 15, and I went over there. You know, it was right by one of the Little League fields. And I uh, went in there, and I started training. And I met these biker guys in there. They used to ride their motorcycles to the gym, and they poured concrete. So, you know, they'd come in and train in their jeans and work boots and no shirts and stuff. Yeah. And <laughs> So they said. Uh, how old were you then? I was 15. 15. Yeah. And then uh, they uh, st started showing me how to lift different. Hey, kid, you're doing that wrong and stuff. And I was, like, scared of them and stuff. And uh, and then, you know, being trained in there for a year or so, when I was uh, 16, I was just, you know, 15 to 16. I was under 16. I was a freshman in high school. And, um I got kicked out of high school uh, because I punched the principal in the nose, the story. What? Yeah, yeah. If you see the old podcast, you know it. So I, me and a friend of mine got into a fight in school. And uh, like I said, I was under 16. And uh, so we were getting uh, suspended. So I was in the, in, the, in the principal's office, and my mom had to come, and this principal was kind of a hard guy. <clears throat> when I walked in, my mom was in the room crying, you know, and he was like, you know, if you knew how to raise your son and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he didn't know that. Oh. But I came, my mom was all Italian, so I came from a strict. My dad was German and Irish. We ate together. We This family was strict. I yeah. just veered off. <clears throat> so <laughs> seeing him. Slightly. I slightly, so, yeah. slightly yeah. veered off. <laughs> I veered off. And seeing my mom crying like that just kind of threw me off a little bit. And I jumped over the desk and socked him in the face and. Then I, I seen the security coming, so I took off running out of the school, ran through there. What was her reaction? Uh, my mom's? Yeah. Well, I didn't see her till I got home. She stayed there, and I ran out because I seen the so security So you just smacked coming. him and yes, ran? Yes, punched him right in the face and then ran, running through houses and stuff, thinking I'm slick and stuff, and I show up, you know, that it was about a 25-minute run from my house to the school, <laughs> and I get to the I get to my house and stuff, and I'm in the backyard, and I walk in the house, and my mom's in there, and then here comes the cops, you know, oh, our man. town cops, which my mom knew because she was the crossing guard, and she ran the yeah, bank, yeah. and so they're like, hey, man, Mrs. Mama C, they call her Mama Chain, Mama C is, uh, where's little Mel, and he's in the basement, okay, they want to talk to him and stuff, so <clears throat> anyways, what happened was my parents had to flip the bill for his hospital stay. You know, not, I mean, I think he had a little busted nose or something like that. They had to flip the bill. So they threw me out of that school, and my mom was going to have to drive me 50 minutes. So I looked at her and said, Mom, I'm going to walk out the back door. I'm not into the school stuff, so why don't you sign me out? So my mom had to sign me out because I wasn't 16 yeah. to go out of school. 
So my family had a huge house and a big pool in the backyard. So I started lounging in the pool, putting suntan lotion on. You know, I was 15, and all of a sudden one day she came home with some work boots, and I go, what are them? She goes, oh, you're going to work. You're not sitting in the yard in the pool. My uncle owned a concrete company. So that's how I started pouring concrete, and that's what them three biker dudes that I had met in this gym were pouring concrete, you know, just a coincidence and stuff. So now I'm 16 years old, and, you know, back then, it's eight, I'm 53, so that's in the 80s, I guess. And, um, you know, I'm making 1500 bucks a week, 18 bucks an hour pouring yeah. concrete. That's a lot of money, right? Yeah. So I buy my first IROC, I buy my first Harley, and then uh, here, lo and so behold. What was, your, what was your first bike? Uh, I, I, my first bike was a Sportster, a chopper Sportster. Really? Yeah, all chopped and longed out, you know what I mean? I bought that, and uh, <clears throat> lo and behold, I find out later in the gym, the same guys that are showing me how to lift weights were the same guys that were part of the Hells Angels. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, they were members, you know. So um, so once once I, you know, seen them guys, and they're like, you got a bike? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, yeah, kid, you're young. I'm like, yeah, I'm 16. And so they said, you know, the story is the same guys that showed me how to train heavy and crazy were the same guys that showed me how to do the motorcycle lifestyle. Wow. That's how I stepped into that world, you know. And uh, and uh, so, you know, the the old rule back then was you have to be 21 to get into the club. <clears throat> None of the other club guys knew how old I was. I already had facial hair. I kind of was already a little bit big, 5'10". I was probably 200 pounds training, pouring concrete and stuff. So when they took me down to the clubhouse to meet everybody, this guy, that's funny story, he's, you know, he got killed in, in, the, in our nonsense. His name was Al, Big Al. And when we're driving down there, and Big Al was like 6'3 and like 380 pounds, of just biker-looking dude, right? And, uh, and he goes, okay, when you get down here, you're 21, remember, okay? And I said, okay, okay. And so how I, old were you? Um, 18. 18. Yeah. So I get down in the room, and the guys get me in the room, and they're just talking. So you want to come around the club, huh? Yes, cause I, yes, sir, I do. I'm telling the president, you know, well, how old are you? And I go, hmm. and I froze up, Nick. And I go, <laughs> 18, and they look at each other, and the, and, the, and the president goes, what the? And, and, and I go, oh, no, no, no. Al didn't know. I go, because I'm in, hanging out in bars. I, I told everybody I'm 21 because I look older, and, and the president goes, yeah, man, you're going to age rough, kid. You look like you're about 25, right? <laughs> <clears throat> so they were like, listen, you can't come into the club. You're 18. You can't, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, we're out. I said, no, I get it. I get it, right? So I get in the car. It's a, it's a winter night. So we're not in the bikes. We're in the car. I get in the car. He looks over at me. He goes, what the fuck, man? And I go, man, bro, I froze in that room. I'm looking at all these older cats, and it scared me. You know, I kind of froze, you know? And he goes, it's okay, man. So I, I, I stayed their friends. I'd go yeah, to yeah, a party yeah. and stuff like that. Well, now a year later, I'm 19, I go to this big party, and they grab me up, and they're like, hey, you know, hey Mel, good to see you. You know, I kind of didn't see them for six, eight months, a yeah, year, yeah. maybe, something like that. You know, I was busy pouring the concrete. Yes, yeah, so you're just pouring concrete work. Yeah. And they're like, how old are you now? I go, 19. And they're like, oh, geez. They're like, okay, well, listen, man, we're going to bend the rules here for you. You know, you can uh, start coming around the club. So that's what I did. Started hanging around with them, and then I became a prospect at right, like, at 20, and then I got my full, I got my patch, like, right before I was 21. Wow. Yeah. So I was super youngest guy over there, you know. 21 years old, yeah. past 10. Yeah. Most yeah. guys, like the president at the time, I mean, you know, he was definitely, you know, if I'm 53 now, I think he's probably 76, 77. Yeah. So most guys were at least a, a 10 year generation gap, 15 year ahead of me. I was the young guy, you know. And you ended up actually becoming uh, the president. president. Yeah. President of yeah. the club, right? At 23. So how in two years did you. <sighs> And, you know, I was like the, I got into the club and I really liked that lifestyle. I loved the brotherhood about it and I loved everything that was going on. And we were in a little squimish with a, uh, another motorcycle club in our yard, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I don't want to call it a, a war. It was just a little thing, you know, fighting when we seen each other, jumping each other, you know, and this, this stuff like that, right? I'm going to did a different podcast and I call it, you know, stuff you'd see on the school playgrounds and stuff. And people <laughs> laughed, you know, yeah. and uh, S- so sim- similar to the same thing. Maybe, yeah. Maybe a little, a little more violent. Yeah. <laughs> so I would be out every night as a prospect and, and, you know, and doing all this stuff. And then they would, I would get home about, you know, six o'clock in the morning, just enough time to jump in the shower and make my lunch for the day. And then I'd get off on the concrete field all day long. And then by nighttime, I'd come home, I'd go hit my gym. I had a local gym, I trained that, that gym. I'd go hit that gym, and then I'd lay down for an hour or so because I knew the cats were going to call me again to come out. So we'd go out, and we'd see what we could get into, and I did that for a long time. And then finally, you know, when I got in the club and I started seeing what guys were doing, and I'm like, man, this working for a living is pretty brutal here. I'm trying to work 10-hour days in the hot sun and then hang out all night and go on trips and stuff like that. This is a little crazy. Well, then I learned the... 
the, the cocaine game, right? Yeah. Back then in the 80s, it was huge, right? I seen guys that were making, uh, you know, a thousand bucks, two thousand bucks a week. And I'm like, wow, they're not killing themselves here. So I went in and, uh, and, and, and told my dear friend, I wasn't working for my uncle no more. I went to a, a, a different company. A bigger company was a good friend of mine. I said, hey, I'm going to, you know, I want to give you my month notice. And he's like, what do you mean? Where are you going? What can I do for you, Mel? Because I was kind of, as me, me and you know each other. When I get focused on something, I get into yeah, it. Yeah. The bodybuilding, I'm 100%. Yeah, yeah. I was into pouring concrete. And loyal to, yeah, yes. to whoever you oh, people I was are. loyal yeah. to the, I, I poured concrete. I loved, I loved working like that, that hard work and just, you know, pouring the concrete. And just, it was like an art for me. And I said, Merrill, I'm not going to another company, man. I'm just going to retire out of working in life. He goes, what do you mean? I go, huh, brother, I'm going to start me a drug empire. <laughs> and he's like, what? And I said, yeah, bro, here I go. And uh, that's how it kind of went from there, man. And uh, everything took off. And then when I became the president at well, 20... Well, hold on, hold on. So you... So the, the club was already into that sort of thing. They were already running business. Yeah, and not in a whole. You know, okay. a lot of guys did like to work in the club. You know, yeah. I always say that the motorcycle clubs never started off as a criminal enterprise. It didn't happen that way. It was brotherhood, you know. It was, you, it was yeah, post-war yeah. Uh, Vietnam Yeah, it was Vietnam brotherhood guys, and stuff. Yeah. And then whatever anybody got into on their own is what they got into, you know. You tried not to bring any heat down on the club, but listen, we're, we're one percenters at the time, right? We're just, yeah. you know, trying to do our own thing and not, you know, where no one's wanting to really punch a clock. But we did have guys that work, but I was the one that chose not to, you know. I just didn't want to go. I wanted to live that one percenter lifestyle. So that's when I, you know, I got in with, with the drugs and got shown that and then started making, you know. So that was on your own or with, like, you just brought the whole club into No, it? that was on my own. So just your deal. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I started, you know, selling the cocaine to the different friends and people that I knew in my towns and stuff like that, you know. Next thing I know, I'm making what I'm making a week at pouring concrete. So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do this concrete no more. Let me have the easy life so I can run around all day with the chicks now that I'm getting into yeah, yeah, and yeah. <clears throat> the motorcycles and being out all night, right? And I just got so taken by that lifestyle, you know. And um, so when I finally was in the club and, 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 and got my patch and everything like that, it was probably not even six, eight months later, I became our sergeant of arms. Yeah. You know, so that's how I started in the, in the, how, in the rankings. How big have you gotten by this point? So now, you know, when I, when I started natural, I started bodybuilding, of course, natural when I was like really li literally 14, I got bit by the weights. But now when I was 19, I met a doctor. And he, and he was like, hey, and, you know, I knew guys were going to him. And he was like, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a little deck on it. I'd go to his office and he'd give me a shot. I'd walk in the office. You'd see, you'd see a little old lady with a broken arm and five dudes that were 290 pounds waiting to see him. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm 19 and I'm like, wow, that's a crazy office right here, right? <laughs> you go back in, you pull your, 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 your pant down, he gives you a shot right in the cheek and stuff. And it was like DECA. And I was yeah. like, I didn't know much about the gear back then, you know, yeah. it was just, but it was all real. So <clears throat> just for me taking that little bit of DECA and the way I could eat and the way these cats showed me how to train old school with the deadlifts and the squats and everything. <sighs> my body went from 200 pounds to 230 pounds and I, you know, just started growing off a little bit of gear. I didn't know the pro bodybuilding circuit until later in life, you know, yeah. I'm taking DECA. Now they give me, Hey, take a D ball, five milligrams of D ball a day, which most guys take 50 to 70, I'm taking five and I'm growing. <clears throat> and they're like, dang man, this kid's got genetics. He's getting big. My dad was a bigger guy. So now by the time I'm 23, I'm 250 pounds, looking like a bodybuilder, you know, and, but wearing a, a, a Hell's Angel cut and running around on my motorcycle, right? You see a lot of old yeah. pictures, you know, and look, look in that look and stuff. So <clears throat> that got me a lot of notoriety and stuff. And uh, one day I came into the meeting, I was late. I called up and I go, hey, guys, I'm going to be 10 minutes late. So, the, you know, it's pretty strict in the, in the meetings. Like, you better be on time. You can't miss yeah, meetings, you know, so... So I got hit, stuck by a train, you know, I'm going to be about 10 minutes late. I come in the room and everything, and everybody was looking, and they said, uh, hey, man, we, we, we had a vote. You know, we had our vote every year as a vote for, you know, uh, leadership and president, vice president, all his positions. And they said, um, yeah, uh, you know, you're not the sergeant of arms anymore, you know. So I looked, and I go, well, how could you guys have a vote without me here? You know, who's voting for the president? Like, what's going on? They, and the president said, hey, man, we want you. You're going to take over for me. You're going to be the president. I said, What? I was kind of blown away. I said, oh, his name was Jerry. I said, man, that's, you've been this for a long time, 15 years, right? And he goes, yeah. Listen, you get around, you travel to all the different chapters, you, you know, you get along with all the fellows and stuff, and it's time, you know? And, and I you said, had a bunch of older <clears throat> guys on the, uh, in, in, in the, the crew. In the crew. Oh, yeah, I was by far the youngest. I think the next probably closest guy to me was 
one of my tight guys in there, and he's probably six, seven years older than me and stuff like that. And then it was me. I was, you know, that's a, a wild part. Yeah. <clears throat> so I said, okay. And I said to him, well, Jerry, you got to, you know, you better show me the ropes here, man. And he kept me under his wing and, you know, kind of showed me different things. And uh, I traveled with him a lot, you know, just so I can get my feet wet and doing things. But, you know, I was always a, a good speaker. I can get into a room and talk to everybody. And, you know, I was always very um, um, diplomatic with everybody. I can laugh and joke. And then when the rules came up, I could, you know, yeah. you know, enforce them and stuff like that. So, you know, that worked for me and then uh, i became the, the president for chicago and then you know was traveling were you the, were you the youngest yeah I was, the, I was the youngest president i, I don't know about now but at yeah. that time yes yeah by far i was the youngest guy when i'd go into president's meetings one once a year you'd have a whole president meeting and you could they would try to get the other countries and if they could come in a lot of guys couldn't get in because of the laws and stuff yeah. you know once you put that patch on then you couldn't get over and stuff <clears throat> so we'd have a president's meeting and I'd look around the room, and I was like, wow, man, I just, you know, these guys are in their 40s and 50s and been around for 35 years and stuff like that, and here I am, you know. And that was an honor for me, you know, to see that and be with these guys that paved the way and stuff like that. It was super cool for me to see, you know. And at the same time, I kept my head about me because, you know, then that's when things started getting crazy in Chicago between us and, and the outlaws, you know, because now we're – you know, we're, we're in town and we're starting to grow and everything. And that's where they started, you know, it was their home base right there in Chicago. <clears throat> and, um, the club that used to, that the angels absorbed that I was part of was a club called the hell's henchmen. So we prospected for the angels and then became a hell's angel chapter. Mm -hmm. So once that happened, you know, the, the city of Chicago flipped on its side and then, you know, the other motorcycle clubs were told you'd be better take a side, not from us, but from the outlaws, like you better take a side. And then that stuff escalated pretty quick, you know. So that's how that whole thing got going fast. And you see a lot of stuff on the ganglands now about that Midwest confrontation that we had with them guys in the in the 90s. It got crazy with the bombings and the shootings. Yeah. And it went from uh, what I called it the, the, the playground, uh, you know, fights and, and throwing tan bark at each other and socking each other here and there to shooting on motorcycles and, you know, they they it put, got it got real serious. They real put fast. The, they put the third largest bomb on our clubhouse to date. Really? You know, yeah. It, it went uh, the the trade centers. Remember the New York trade mm -hmm. centers, McVeigh with the Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and a hundred pounds of C four in front of our Grand Avenue clubhouse. The third largest car bomb to, right now to to date that, that was ever set right off. in front of your clubhouse. Right in, in the building, they put pulled a car up in front of our in front of our Anybody clubhouse, and no, nobody was in there. Thank God, and they thought it was a. The, the ATF people told us that if somebody was in there, it would have just blew all their uh, everything. They would have been bleeding from everywhere, the concussion. Yeah. You know, and, the, and, the, and it, I, the, I guess, it, I don't know much about explosive, but I guess it wasn't shaped right. So the, it was in the trunk of a car, 100 pounds of C4, so it blew down, right? Is that about? Yeah, yeah. it blew a seven-foot hole down into the sidewalk, which then the concussion came back up and it hit the front of our building, and we had a big, huge brick building with some steel in it and and a big steel door that was on a roller you had to push it on a roller it was so heavy well it blew that door th across the length of the, the whole building the width of the whole building out the back of the out the back of the building through the uh, brick and everything and the concussion hit the building and it went across the street and you see on the video cameras of a city bus just going by this was five o'clock at night in the one of the busiest streets in downtown chicago grand avenue and this bus just made it by, thank the Lord, right, a bus full of people. And then the concussion hit the house across the street, which, thank God, no one's home. And that was one of them siding homes, like aluminum siding, and it just ripped a siding. It looked like one of them uh, old cartoons where they, the, the, the character got blown up and everything's pushed back on him, you know. <laughs> yeah. So by the grace of God, nobody got hurt. There, it was just God's timing that nobody was in the path of that concussion, that you know that's i learned what that does the concussion you know yeah. it's the force you know so that's when the atf and that's when everybody came down crazy that with something like that going on the bombings and stuff when you're doing stuff like that and me and my crew knew nothing about that explosive stuff i mean we couldn't even change the batteries in our pagers we were we were just <laughs> we were some just thug goons you know like man yeah. so we didn't know what these guys were doing you know and uh you know to get in to get into like what they were doing, we used to, you know, have them, the mechanic things you lay down on, what do they call them, dollies that you lay yeah, down yeah. on and look, you know, so we used to have them and we'd put mirrors on them 
and I had a vet now at the time, that whatever year it was, you know, 92 vet, and I'd have that thing in the back of my car. So when I came out of a building or something, I'd take it out and, and roll that whole thing under my car and look for, you know, any devices because – that's what they did. They because uh, they were targeting you. Yeah, yeah, and they got one of our guys from Rockford, which was you know about two hours away from us, and um, you know he had a remote start on his car. He started the it was a truck. He started the truck, and uh, they put the device underneath it, and they put a um, a piano or a wire from the yoke to the to the detonator part. So when he put it in reverse, that yoke spun and it blew him up. And uh, by the grace of God, he lived. But it, it, Holy it cow. he's in a wheelchair. It, it blew his legs all apart. Blood was pumping over died a couple times on the way to the, to the hospital. They revived him and then made it work once he got there. But and we didn't know that game. So, you know, I had to figure out what we were doing. And, uh, you know, of course, I found a retired Navy SEAL and said, let's get busy here. You know, if they're going to start doing it, we could better do it back. <laughs> you Was know? he in the club? Yeah, we got yeah. him. Yeah, he became in the club and stuff like that. So, yeah. <clears throat> and then, um, you know, that probably lasted. It, it didn't last as long as, you know, you would think, you know, but a couple of years of that stuff, a lot. that intensity is yeah. a lot, you know, and it took its toll on everybody. And, you know, we, you know, it, 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 it kind of like ripped the meaning of it apart, you know, like the brotherhood and stuff like that, because now we were focused on this full on fight, you know, you can't go anywhere. I mean, I was out everywhere. Of course, I'd never, I was too young to stay home. I wasn't going to stay home. I didn't join a club to sit in the house. Yeah. So I was out. But when I was out, I had a crew with me. You know, I trained every day in the gym, and I'd have one or two guys go with me to watch the, every watch around why I could train, you know, because I was that young dude. And then I became the target not only for the law enforcement but for them other cats that were like – I was going to say, now that people are fighting and other people are getting hurt, I would imagine you had a lot of federal agencies starting to pay attention. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah, it was so bad probably by 95, 96 – that they were just sitting out in front of one of my homes. I had a few different spots. I lived at with some different girls, you know, yeah. different houses and stuff. And they were just sitting out there blatantly with the tripod on top of the roof. And I would go out and ask them, fellas, man, like my neighbors don't know about all what I'm doing here. You know, I don't mind. You're out here, you're doing your job, but can you do it from in the car? Like you're out <laughs> in the tripod smoking cigarettes, just videoing me, right? And they'd smile and laugh. You know, it was never nothing personal between the agents and me because I knew they had a job to do. I was trying to figure out what I had to do. So, you know, I wasn't that guy that was like, hey, F you guys. I, I was real cordial with him, you know. Yeah. You know, I used to laugh because they'd be in the back of our clubhouse trying to get pictures of the new guys or the prospects or hanging arounds that we got, and they'd be hiding behind dumpsters and not getting their pictures, and I'd come out and I'd go, guys, stand for the picture because they're going to take your picture and get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> if you think you're going to be covert coming into this club, putting this patch yeah, on, yeah. you got another thing coming. Like, get ready to get known. <laughs> Just take your photo, let them, let them, let them get out of the place. Yeah, so you yeah. get ready to get known, guys, because you're not getting covert here. If you were doing something under the, under the radar before you came over here, expect it to be in the radar. Yeah. You know, if you had a gig, you know, I had a good, real good friend of mine, an older school cat about, you know, if I was 25, he was probably 40. And he was slinging cocaine for 20-plus years, and nobody knew his business. He was undercover. He had a little gig going on, and he made money. And I told him when he wanted to come around, I said, man, bro, I don't know if I would do that if I was you. Because now you got a good thing going you got right a good now. thing going. No one cares. And you're going to get exposed. Now you're going to come around, and they're going to go, oh, hey, um, you know, Mike so-and-so, who's he? Let's look him up. Okay, what's he do for a living? And now you're exposed. That's just how it was, you know. Yeah. So so <clears> you so you, t- so you joined at 19. Mm-hmm. And then by 23, you're, Three, you're I president. Was the president, yeah. And then things kind of came to an abrupt end. Yeah, things came, you know, 1997. Um, and how old were you then? Oh, God, let's see. I was born in 69, 79, 89, right? So you're uh, almost 30. Yeah, I'm almost 30, upper 20s. Almost, almost yeah, 30. almost 30, right? Um, um, I did it myself, nothing to do with the club, but <clears throat> I beat up a guy pretty bad that was beating up an ex-girlfriend of mine. I was laying his hands on an ex-girlfriend. So as the story has it, I I had four girls that I kind of had were in my stable at the time. And, you know, I, listen out there, the women, you can't, I'm not a womanizer. You can't falter me for this. This was back in the 90s and stuff. And I loved all four of these girls. <laughs> so I was not willing to get rid of them. I had, you know, a girl that I was with eight years, a girl that I was with six, four, and then this the two, you know, this, yeah. this girl, Kendall, that I, did this for us and I was really good friends with everybody's family and stuff and had them you know we all kind of lived in different spots not together four different spots I had and um me and Kendall had split up just because you know I couldn't give her no more time and you know but I was very tight with her mom dad you know her dad and mom had this big 
local bar in our area that we all hung out at and stuff. And uh, the guy that she got into the relationships with after me, just, you know, he was a street dude himself. And, uh, you know, he just got some jealousy going in him. And, you know, she was a beautiful girl. And he started knocking around, you know. You know, he look, this guy's looking at you. Why, uh, you're at the bar. I don't want you there. He just became jealous like that, you know. And I didn't talk to Kendall for, you know, for a while because she was pretty scorned at, at me when we broke up, you know. And I would go into her parents' club still because I was very tight with her mom and dad. And, you know, she knew the other three girls that I was with for years. But then I had my girls that I picked up at night. They're random girls that I just were on my bike. Hey, and I'd bring them into the bar, you know, and she'd yeah. be all mad, you know what I mean? And she, there's nothing she could do because yeah, uh, yeah. we were going to do it. <clears throat> so, um, so a real long story short, I got wrapped up with this he, the, the kid got under my skin and then you know i he, him and her lived in, in in a house together that was her real dad's house the guy that uh her mom was married to now her stepdad was my friend that's why you know so they lived in the house together and the and uh so i ended up it being in the house and uh didn't, didn't go too good for him in the house but we got caught in the house we got caught in the house me and i i took two of my two of my friends, which happened to be two guys from the club. It wasn't yeah. a club deal, <clears throat> of course, but as we got arrested in the house and they're like, oh, there's three Hells Angels in the house. Well, the feds tried to make that a, a later in the racketeering case because they're trying to say oh, we... Oh, so they added it to the <clears throat> other thing. They, they hit me with it, with it uh, f- nice eight years later under the racketeering thing I got. That was a predicate act under the racketeering. And even though it was just my own deal, but I brought two guys in yeah. the club and they can kind of throw that but you're predicate you're going to explain act. in a little bit. We'll, we'll get to that. <clears throat> yeah, you're going to explain how that works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we got caught in the house and, uh, you know, they, they took us off that night and uh, next morning we went in for a bond hearing, you know, no bond. I mean, they were, they charged us with, uh, attempted murder, kidnapping, home invasion, everything you could think of. And oh, they just like threw it at us. Yeah. And then the lowest one was an aggravated battery, you know, with a weapon. You know, that was the lowest uh, that, you know, the, the of the felonies and stuff. So we, we got bonded out uh, probably five or six days later when they did the fingerprints on the guns and stuff. And our fingerprints didn't come up on them. So the judge set a bond. We all got out. It was, uh, I believe the year was 97 and it was uh, December 24th, Christmas Eve, we got out that morning. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so we fought that case from the street for, God, probably a year to 14 months. And then the, the, we, then the, the three of us got found guilty. We went to a trial, and uh, the judge found us guilty just of the aggravated battery, the home invasion, because t- Kendall and her stepdad let us in the house. It was a real dad's house. He said, hey, that's my daughter in the house. They didn't, they had the keys. You know, we went in yeah. the house. uh no attempt, attempted murder charge. We beat the kidnapping and stuff like that. So, you know, we got we got f- uh, four years on that sentence. Everybody did? Everybody did, yeah. We got four years across the board on that sentence. So that was the first time I was going away at, you know, 28, 29 years old. 20, uh, yeah, 28, I think. Um, <clears throat> the first time me going away. Well, when I was away, the, f- the feds had uh, a thing on me that they ended up indicting me for. I, I one of the guys that was in the club with me, I didn't know that he got busted and he decided to go to work for the feds. So they put him on the street. They busted him at, they raided his house at three o'clock in the morning. This is what we got you on. You're looking at 60 years at 85%. You want to work? And he said, I do. Okay, we're putting you on the street. No one even knows you got busted. You're signing this agreement. What you is guys, you going to work? You guys didn't know. Had not had a clue. <clears throat> and I was tight with this dude. <clears throat> and uh, so he's now, you know, in the club out there and, uh, the two guys that he introduced me to were FBI agents that, you know, I didn't know. They were posing as mobsters from St. Louis. <clears throat> but I knew a lot of the mobsters are all around the Chicago area. So when I met him, I didn't think, hey, guys, how you doing, and this and that. And then they had this big office, and in this office they had a warehouse, and they had boats in there and ca- exotic cars and motorcycles. Oh, what do you do with these things? Oh, we ship them overseas. They're all stolen goods and stuff. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So I go in this room, this office, they got it recorded, they want me to do a murder for hire. So I'm sitting there and the guy's talking to me and stuff. And he's like, yeah, hey, opens up a briefcase, you know, it's got like 60, 80 grand in there and stuff. He's like, caramel. And I said, nah, I'm not into that, man. Do your own work. Why are you coming to us to sub something out for us? We don't do that. We got enough of our own stuff to do. Why don't I? I was kind of t- turned off by him. Like you're a mobster and you're subbing this out. Thought you guys had your own. Yeah, so I thought, I thought that was out. your thing. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm good. So I said to my the guy's name was Jim. He's passed away. And I said, uh, <clears throat> what, "What's with these guys?" Well, I don't know, man. They, you know, they just wanted to talk to you, and they figured, you know, they want to put some money in your pocket. I said, "I'm good." 
So a month or so later, we're driving. So that didn't work. Yeah, it didn't work. He goes, hey, we got to stop over at that. I got to see the fellows. I'm like, okay, we're at the warehouse and stuff like that. <clears throat> so now they talk to me about guns and automatic weapons. So I looked at Jim and I'm like, why don't you get them for him? You know, you got the same. You can do what you want. You know, if you want some yeah. guns, we all had the same outlets, you know. But I didn't think nothing because he was my guy. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think nothing. <clears throat> so here's where I screw myself. As I'm looking at all these boats and everything like that, and I go, so you guys take the, he goes, yeah, we'll give you, well, you got something? I go, yeah, I got this crazy IROC out here, the Z28 IROCs, right? And I had about 10 grand worth of tunes in this car. I had the car all done up, right? I go, I don't want it no more. But nobody could afford to buy it. Like, I don't want to sell it. Nobody really, young kids can't afford to buy this car, right? I said, so they said, listen, report it stolen. We'll give you two grand in your pocket and, and, and give us a few days. We'll tell you when to call in for the insurance and collect the insurance on it. I said, Great, that's a great deal. Okay, they give me two grand. <clears throat> I get some glass. I go to this gym, not my local gym, another gym. I put the glass on the ground by where I said I parked my car. I go in and train. I come out. I'm like, oh man, my car got stolen. I call the cops up. They come make the report. Great, right? I got two grand in my pocket. The insurance, co- all state pays me off on the car, everything I needed, right? Well, that's great. Well, that would have been an entrapment case because they came to me first, right? But my dumbass brought them more cars. <laughs> <laughs> like this is a great deal it's a great gig <laughs> so i'm going this. to my friends nick mike tim hey you don't want that come here give it to me <laughs> i'm putting two grand in my pocket bringing them these cars and so i did it a couple more times which i found out i furthered the yeah yeah, yeah. The thing. so if it would have been the one thing they entrapped me they brought it to me that that would have it wouldn't would have gone been my lawyers like we had it we could we would have walked out of this but i brought them some more so i don't know about all this stuff <clears throat> yeah they pulled Jim off the street because he got in with one of my guys, and w- there was a lawyer back in the day that was helping us out with a lot of gun cases and stuff. <sighs> he, he went into a coma. They didn't think he was going to make it. He comes out of the coma. His wife divorced him, married his partner, and took all the business stuff from him. Now he's out. So what's he want her? He wants her killed. So he comes to me. I said, no, 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 no. We don't do that stuff. I'm not, you know, we, don't do, we don't get involved in nobody else's business. Well, he gets an angel on the, on the, that wants to take the money from him, and they sit out, and, you know, this is all, everybody went to prison for it, so I could talk about it. <clears throat> they sit out, they put the bomb underneath the wife's car. They don't know what they're doing with it. The bomb blows down. It burns her feet. Well, they got caught, and the guy that gave them the C4 to do it with was the informant, Jim. Mm. So he wires himself up and goes back to the guys, hey, I need that C4 back. What do you mean you need it back? We used it. You used it on what? And the lawyer's wife had so once they came and did that raid on the two guys in the club, they pulled Jim off the street, obviously, and he was gone. <clears throat> so he just did he just disappear? Yeah, from they, you guys. Yeah, they took him. They hit him out with his mean, protection. From your per, but from your perspective, did he just like gone? He was gone. He was gone. Didn't you know, know what happened. Once I got the call that morning, hey, they raided the clubhouse and they grabbed the two fellas. It, it, it all came from Big Jim, and I'm like, what? What? And then his apartment. Was oh, so you knew that he yeah, was, it was okay. gone. Yeah, he was gone. I went by his apartment, gone the whole nine yards. You know, I'm like, ah, oh, okay. So he's in Whitsack. He's yeah. Out. So I'm thinking, I forgot about the, the, the car stuff because I just forgot about it. So statute of limitations runs out on not the Rico stuff, but this stuff in five years. So as I'm getting, as I'm going through the trials <clears throat> of the the stuff for the state, I get a knock on my door. And here comes this federal eight, these two federal eight, not the two guys, but these two federal agents. Hey, Mel, we need to talk to you. I said, okay, well, come on in, man. Come on in, sit down. What's going on? Yeah, we're getting ready to hit you with an indictment, you know, but we want to know if we can call your lawyer up or we got to knock your doors. And I said, please, guys, don't knock any more of my doors. And this was my third house raid now, if they would have did it. I had two house raids before this. <clears throat> I go, you don't have to knock my door. In. You got something on me? Call my lawyer. What are you charging me with? I said, they said, well, we can't tell you right now. Something, God, the feds are here. Oh, what are they going to get me for? You know, yeah. I didn't know. So my lawyer calls me a couple of days later. All right, we got to turn ourselves in in the morning to the Dirksen building. Okay, I go down there. We're talking and everything. And they here comes out the two federal agents now that we're the make-believe wise guys. Hey, Mel, how you doing? You remember us? No. <laughs> you know, it's almost five years later. You don't remember us? No. Well, we remember you pretty good. Okay, stand up. We're charging you. Mail fraud. So I'm looking around at my lawyer, and I'm like, mail fraud, okay, that's, I don't know what that is, but it don't sound crazy at all. This sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I defrauded all state through the United States mail by getting them checks. Oh. Uh, so they had me on mail fraud, which seemed pretty pimpy, right? Yeah. You got the leader of the Hells Angels in front of you, and you get them on a mail fraud. But they knew what they were doing, because now I went away to the state, I took a felony. 
Okay. Now they threw another felony on me, a federal felony. Now my criminal history just went from a zero to, to between a two and three on the top of the, right. you know, the federal right. guideline book is criminal history on top and your offense level on the, on the left side. And where that interjects with each other is the months you end up getting for when they right. get you a fed case. So they knew what they were doing. They're like, let's get this kid locked, you know, rolled up here. So I pled guilty to the mail fraud and got 18 months. So the day that I was getting released out of the state penitentiary, I went into the Sally Port. They switched my handcuffs. The marshals picked me up, took me to a federal holding facility, and then designated me to a federal prison. So I really did back-to-back -back sentences, you know, and then came home. And that was the like the very end of 2000, I believe, I came home. Couldn't talk to the club. So I was there's a, a total of four years for the both of things. Yeah. The first time. Yes. So yes. two things, four years. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, the assault and then and, the and mail the, fraud. And then, yeah, and then the mail fraud. Yeah. So then came I came home, in came home in 2000. Are you in the club at this point? I'm in, still in the club, but I'm on a thing called non-association that the government gives you. I can't see one, talk to one, can't, nothing in the club. But if mentally, I walk, you're still <clears> there. Mentally, I'm there, yeah. yeah. I just can't go down to the clubhouse. I can't go see anybody. I can't visit anybody. If I walked into a gas station or, you know, a restaurant and they were in there, I had to leave. Yeah, yeah. So it was pretty right. strict. And they were watching me. They were all over me, you know, when I came home. So I had that non-association. I started running some nightclubs for a dear friend of mine that had big, huge nightclubs in Chicago. I started putting all the security together for him. Well, I was so good at doing that in the security and putting all the guys in play that some other clubs grabbed a hold of me. And then it became a great gig for me where I was making great money. And I'm like, God, all I got to do is go down and be in these nightclubs in my presence and have fun. And I'm, you know, I'm making, you know. 2500 3000 bucks a week. I'm like, this is a great, you know, and I'm out till five, six in the morning having the time of my life, you know, being on non-association. And that kind of gave me, that gave me the, opened up my mind a little bit. You know, I had my daughter, <clears throat> I had my daughter when I was just turning 17. She's 35 now. Yeah. So she was in my life through all that, but I wasn't with her mother. We split up and financially I was there for my daughter, but physically I was running all over the country. I didn't see, get to see her a ton. And my mom and dad were st were both still alive, and <clears throat> and you know, in a big Italian family, every Sunday dinner, you better come to the house and eat. I don't care what I was doing or what chick was with me. <laughs> I, mean, I could have been out all night the night before, and the girls on the back of my bike, and we're showing up, and my mom's feeding her too. My, yeah. You know, Italians got love for everybody, right? And uh, so, you know, I got to spend time with the family now and see everything, and I was like, man, this. Life is uh, it's kind of getting it's crazy for me, and I don't know if I want to do this no more. And I'm the type of guy where if I can't give 100, percent I'm not going to fake it. Yeah, now you're in your th you're in your thir early yeah, 30s, yeah, early 30s, yeah. you know, making you know good money legally, doing some stuff, and uh, so um, two th right before I got indicted in 2004, I called the guys up on the phone. I said, guys, listen, man, I'm, I think it's time for me. I'm a, you know, there's no retiring in the club. You quit the club. I think it's time for me. It's time for me to move on. I said, I'm just not, my head's not in it. And in that stage of the game and in that lifestyle, if your head's not in it, you're, you're going to get yourself hurt. Or somebody else. Or somebody yeah. else. Yeah, you yeah. got to be tight in what you're doing. You know, yeah. the, the, the differences between the Angels and the Outlaws at that time were kind of settled down. We kind of put them, put, them, put them away right before I went away in 97. We sat down with each other and said, let's be compatible with each other. <clears throat> well, by the time I got home, that was going to the wayside. The tit for tat was coming back in and stuff like that. And, you know, the, and the you just weren't into yeah, it. Yeah, the fellas thought I was going to come back and then I was going to be the president again and we were going to roll this again. And I'm like, listen, I, I'm not making the penitentiary revolving door for me yeah. because they're not small sentences now. Yeah. Now my criminal history is up there. Now we knew that they were trying to get us with the racketeering because they recoed the, the outlaws in 97. And it was a successful RICO for them. And there were like 40 something guys that all ended up either going to trial or pleading out. You know, when they got you with the RICO, their eyes are so dotted. Explain, so explain, explain what a RICO is. Mm. So, for people that don't so the know. RICO is short for for or for racketeer influenced corrupt organization. So it's kind of a blanket, right? And everything they got an enterprise. Mm -hmm. The enterprise at the time was the Hell's Angels. The outlaw enterprise was the outlaw nation. You know, <clears throat> so everything that becomes a predicate act. So if we you know, went into a bar and, and caught some outlaws and beat them up in a bar, that becomes a predicate act later on the RICO. Same with them, you know, both sides, you know. You're doing it for furtherance of the organization. So you're not just doing it for Mel Chancey and Nick Kay and, and you know, we're doing it because we're part of this entity, you know, yeah, that's yeah. the thing. And everything's a predicate act. You beat guys up in a bar, you know, there were shootings on the highway, 
bombings of buildings. Well, we weren't doing that for our own selves. We were doing that for the club, and that's how the RICO comes in and blankets it, right? And, um, you know, I understood the RICO coming up through the club because, you know, I've seen other chapters get RICO'd and stuff like that. But I didn't really know the extent of it. We used to say we're trying to keep ourselves from getting a RICO case. Well, now that I'm home, I kept hearing about them subpoenaing people to go to grand juries on me. Different people in my life, different stuff that happened, you know, and I'm like, okay, well, they're really trying hard to get this racketeering thing going. Well, years went by, you know, a couple of years went by and stuff. And then I heard that they actually opened up the RICO case in like 95. And I'm like, okay, we're in 2002 or three. They don't have nothing. If they're RICO and these friends of mine, and they're coming back and asking me the questions they asked them in the Not grand knowing, jury. they're just stacking <clears throat> the deck. They're just stacking the deck. Yeah. Yeah. They like to get the more, the merrier. Yeah. You know, um, you know, the more predicate acts, the better, you know. So uh, right before they, I got the indictment, uh, I had the four girls that I was with, and I had a girlfriend in New York. I had a girlfriend in Rockford. I had girls that, you know, when I traveled, they were like my travel girls. I'd go and see them when I was in town, right? So one morning I wake up, and, you know, it was, it was afternoon, actually, and I'm out running around, and my cell phone rings, and it's this girl from Rockford, Wendy, and she's like, hey, babes. I'm like, what's going on? She goes, hey, uh. Some feds just left my house. I got a subpoena to go down to Peoria for a grand jury. And I go, yeah. They said, yeah, something about a racketeering case with you. And I'm like, when's the date? And then she tells me the date. I'm like, okay. 20 minutes later, half hour later, the one my one girl, Joanne, calls me. Hey, hey, what's going on, babes? Babes, the feds just left her. What they want? They gave me a subpoena to go down in front of a grand jury in Peoria. So what's the date? She tells me the date. I'm like, okay. Hour later, Nancy calls me. I go, hold on, let me guess. You got a subpoena. She goes, how'd you know? I go, it seems to be going around today. Well, they went and hit them all on the same day. Agents here, agents there, the New York girl, everything. <clears throat> so the, what they did was on that, on that grand jury day, they had all the girls sitting in one room together. And a lot of them were former dancers and stuff. And, you know, the Nancy, the Joanne, the Kendall, and Tanda, they all, they all kind of knew about each other. Nancy didn't because she was my longtime girl. So I kind of like... If anybody that I Insul sheltered insulated. was Nancy. Yeah, the other girls kind of knew what I was doing and knew about each other, and we just rolled with it. <clears throat> so they wanted to aggravate everybody in that room. So when they came and hit the grand jury, everybody's pissed off, right? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, that was their play. So um, every I told everybody, call me when you get out of here. Call me when you get out. A couple girls they never used on the stand. Nancy, they put her on the grand jury. They, she said they just asked her some, you know, would you ever see him do this? you ever see him do that? No, nah, Mel never brought the club around me, which, thank the Lord, that I was smart enough to separate them lives. Yeah. I didn't bring the girls on my motorcycles. I didn't bring the girls to club parties. Probably, and, and the truth of the matter was, it was because that was my magnet for other girls. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe I wasn't that good of a guy. Like, I don't want to hurt them, but I just, there was other chicks around. <clears throat> but worked out good for me because... You know, Joanne barely knew. Maybe she knew one or two members. Tanda, maybe she knew one or two members because she worked at a restaurant. I never involved it, you know. So that was the good thing there. So when I called my lawyer up and I go, what is this dog and pony show? And he goes, Mel, this is, if they're subpoenaing your, all these girls that you were with, they're at the bottom of the barrel. And we're like, yeah, not knowing that. That was just to aggravate everybody. That was the cherry on the top of the cake. They had it. They had everything they needed. And shortly after that, <clears throat> then our doors got kicked in. You know, and uh, they indicted four of us. Me, my sergeant of arms from Chicago, and two Rockford Hells Angels, the president <clears throat> and uh, the vice president from out there. That was the, that was, they raided all them. We, they, they raided us all at the same time in the morning, took them guys down. Everybody beat me to the federal courthouse in the holding facility. And uh, <clears throat> so now I'm, I'm out of the club, though, now. I yeah. re quit the club already probably, you know, uh, maybe eight months before this, right? <clears throat> and, uh, so they're going, they go, we got one more coming. And everybody's going, you know, my club name was Road. And they're like, oh, yeah, we know who that is. It's got to be Road, you know, because how are they going to leave me out of a RICO, right? So then I show up at the courthouse and stuff. And uh, we go in front of the judge later that afternoon. Government's reading all of our racketeering indictments off and stuff like that. And uh, <clears throat> so, you know, no bond. You know, we're off flight risks and stuff. Yeah. There's no bond on the RICO and stuff. So we just sit and you know, fight the case. Because they know you've got places overseas. And you could run, yeah, yeah, you know. And, you know, if, if me and, and me and my, my right-hand man, the Sergeant Arms at the time, you know, he was already to the penitentiary twice. I already did two stints, the state and the federal, right? So our criminal histories were up there. Now, if we were knuckleheads and decided to fight the government and go to trial, 
you know, we had mandatory minimums of like 25 years at 85%. That's what I was going to say. I was like, what were you, what were you looking <clears throat> so at? So we were looking at 25. We lost the trial. We were up in the, up in the 25 era, you know, <clears throat> but none of us wanted to just take a plea or go roll over and indict other people. Right. I mean, none of us were willing to do that, you know, because when you first sit in the room, they're like, all right, man, you want to, you want to, you want that time cut? Well, here it go. You're gonna, we're gonna use you and travel you around to all kinds of different trials, and you're gonna be a circus show testifying against everything we need you for. And we were like, "Time out! That's not happening here. Where are you putting me?" And my sergeant of arms was a huge guy too. Where do you think you're putting us in Timbuktu, Iowa, in the witness protection program? We're not gonna blend in. It's not happening. We're not doing that. We're not gonna, you know, flip on everybody. So months went by, and we're figuring things out with the lawyers. Well, since it was, you know, a 12 year old RICO indictment. And there was no murders. That changes the game. <clears throat> you got actual murders in the RICO indictment, and there's not much they're going to be able to do for you. Ours were, you know, the shootings of Bob. I mean, the, you know, there was some heavy stuff. But so we all were able to take a good plea from the government and, you know, not come in on anybody, admit to what we were doing in the club. You know, we were part of a criminal enterprise that was at a war with another motorcycle club and plead guilty to them charges, which was exactly what we wanted to do at the time, you know. <clears throat> and, um, we didn't know what the time was, but what they did for my three co-defendants, they gave them a, what they call a global plea. All three of them had to say yes to it. If one of them didn't take it, they couldn't get the plea. They gave them a global plea to do for 51 months. And at the time, we were already sitting, and it was about 15 months now already, Nick. So I was like, wow, that's a great plea for these guys. Hey, how come I can't get that? Well, you know, you got leadership organizer role that's putting you a little bit higher. And you are part of a drug conspiracy that you just got dropped against them. So they had, we both had the racketeering charges and a drug conspiracy, okay? So this is what the people seen on my first podcast because when I got locked up and I was in jail and, you know, fighting this and I wasn't in the club no more, well, some of my dear best friends at the time that were in the club decided to go start telling people, he's ratting, he's rolling over in there. And I'm hearing it all because I got some friends coming to me and I said, guys, listen, I'm not rolling over on nobody. But I'm not going to be able to prove that right now. Time will tell. That guy, them guys want to say all that about me. So be it. Because they heard that I sat down and listened to what the government had to say. I said, so be it. I said, listen, if I want to roll on everybody, doors are getting kicked in. So time will tell. <clears throat> so we all had a drug conspiracy. The guy that the, the the Hell's Angel that put my other three co-defendants in the drug conspiracy, as he's in the witness protection program, gets himself shot and killed by a ripping off a drug dealer. Nothing to do with the club. It was just a, a gangster type of dude, ripped off this drug dealer one time, got him for dope and money, left, seen him in a bar about three or four months later, punked him out again. The guy pulled a gun out and shot him in the head. So now this guy is gone out of the picture. He can't come and testify against these three guys for the drug part that he said he was part of. They said to me, we don't have these guys in a drug conspiracy unless you're saying you sold them drugs. I said, listen, I never sold these three brothers drugs at all. My drug operation came from outside of the club. The guy that I got the drugs from wasn't a member, and the people that I was selling the drugs to weren't members. We all had our own. I'm going to sell drugs to my own guys. They had their own outlet, <laughs> right. too. So, with, with, so they got pulled. With me not test, being able, you know, to, able, willing to testify and say that it was a lie, they had to drop the drug conspiracy against them three. So as we were in court... And the government said, Your Honor, we are formally dropping the drug conspiracy against these three individuals here on a part of what Mel Chancey told us. I looked back in the courtroom and seen some members that were blowing my name out there. And I went, you're telling, you're telling everybody on the street I'm a rat. And here I just got these three guys out of a drug conspiracy. Which would, which would have been? Would have put, they wouldn't have had that global plea. That yeah. would have put way more time on the, on the, on the, on the offer. But they, I had to look at over a couple decades. Yes, yeah, I had to eat of the drug months. conspiracy. Yeah. Yes, I had to because I was part of my own drug conspiracy. Yeah. They had seven guys that were testifying, kind of willing to testify against me that they bought kilos from me in the whole nine yards, you know. So they couldn't drop the drug conspiracy. So I, so I pled guilty to the racketeering and a drug conspiracy where the other three guys pled guilty to just racketeering acts. Got the 51 months. I got 111 months, which was 9-3. But the, the great thing about it was with me sitting down and doing that prof, they call it a proffer in the room, right? And uh, that's where people are like, oh, he's proffering. Well, when you, if you proffer and you're going to throw somebody under the bus and stuff, when it comes their turn to go to trial or whatever they do, you better, you have to be there. 
So, you know, that's what I kept telling everybody. Well, we'll see. Let's see how many trials. Let's see who gets indicted for me. Not one person in that club had to pick up a phone, Nick, and call a lawyer. Not one person had to spend a dime to call a lawyer o- over what I pledged you to. said guilty and you I went said away guilty for and we went away. All, th- all four of us. We just yeah. did our thing. Them guys got kicked out of the club in bad standings because they pled to the RICO. My status got changed to bad standings because I pled to the RICO from yeah. my left and good. So be it. I get it. If that's the club rule, that's the club rule. But not one of them, nobody in that club could say I hurt nobody in the club. Pled to my own stuff. If you think it was wrong that I sat down and did a proffer with the government, everybody's got their own opinion. But I had my life to look at, too. Yeah. I'm going to soldier up right now and go take 26 years because you, I'm not supposed to say that I was part of a criminal enterprise. It didn't work like that for me. I, as long as I hurt nobody, and today I'm, I'm home since 08, and I did that big podcast with, with Chris Cavallini. Yeah. It's got 2 million views and, you know, 7,000 comments on under there. And I said the same thing. I go, not one person could come under here and say anything in this club that I hurt anybody. Inside the club, outside the club, not a personal friend, not the private guy I was getting drugs from, zero. The government wanted us to plead to the case and put it behind them after 12 years. And that was the beauty of it, you know. So you did 9-3? <clears throat> no. So we came back in, and for me sitting down with the proffer and kind of letting everybody and letting the government know, a lot of stuff they had in there, Nick, was untrue. They had a lot of stuff that from people that came in before us, members that came in before us and wanted to blow the totality of what we did. So up, they were just stacking all that stacking stuff Stacking all up. the yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I, I corrected a lot of lies that these former informants told. So I got the I got the deal for you know the proffer for sitting down and being truthful just like them guys got the deal for sitting down in their proffer and being truthful, <clears throat> and um, and then they 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 dropped my 111 months to 60 months. Okay, you know, cause, cause kind of similar to them, you know, eight or nine more months or ten more months, and them then them guys got you know. So that was my deal for the proffer. So I came home in 2008, is when I came home. But uh, you know, and I know we'll get into talking about it, but that's you know. That second, that, well, the first time, second time away federal, this was, I guess, technically my third prison sentence and stuff. But that's where my relationship with the Lord got so strong. Because I kind of, when I first went in, I was like, okay, God, how come? I cleaned up my life. I'm running a nightclub. Were you a believer all before that? Yeah, I was come from a strict Catholic background, you know, my mom and dad church and Catholic upbringing and stuff. So Dif- That's <clears> different, though. Than different, the, yeah. yeah it's a different but story. I knew the Lord. Yeah. I knew the Lord. Funny story is I used to, you know, uh, come home at nighttime, not every night, but some nights I'd come home and get down on my knees and pray and say, Lord, you know, forgive me for what's the way I'm living life. Like, I know this ain't right, but forgive me. But then in the morning, I got right back up and did everything again, right? That <laughs> yeah. was the biggest hypocrite ever. That's a, typical, that's a, Catholic, that's a Catholic thing. Yeah. It's a Catholic guilt Say a night. prayer, yeah. say Hail hey, Mary, and, and you get back to work. You get back <laughs> yeah. to work. So I, I used to say I'm the biggest hypocrite. But when I went away for this RICO, and at first I was mad. I was like, geez, okay, Lord, how come? How come all this stuff now? I'm doing the right thing, blah, blah, blah. But I really wasn't doing the right thing. Yes, I laid the motorcycle world down. But I still was running around with the girls. I still was, you know, I wasn't selling the drugs. I still was just myself, you Not know. Not being a good man. Yes, basically. yeah, yeah. Yes. So a couple months after being locked up with the, you know, with right, right after the, the RICO indictment, I just was in this cell, and I was by myself. I was in this 8 by 10 cell by myself, and I was reading some scripture out of the Bible, and that's when I was like, you know what, Lord, I, I can't do this no more, man. And I literally got down on my knees, felt tears in my eyes coming from my eyes and I was like okay God I don't really know exactly what to say to you but here it goes take my life I can't do this no more I'm crashing the car take the wheel of my life I want you to be my savior I know how to come to you I just don't know the words to say but from this day on I want you to teach me and show me I want to be a new creation in you and I knew how to say all that right I had a longtime friend of mine by the name of Pastor Steve, that was a Christian that was always praying for me. I'd come over to his house. He wouldn't push it on me. His family loved me. Even when I was in the height of my stuff, you know, I was always the same guy, right? You'd leave your kids with me because you'd be like, man, man, man." you know, I was always that guy. Tight with everybody, loyal to everybody. And so I knew knew how to come to the Lord, and that's what I did down on my knees. And I said, okay, you got to guide me because I don't know step one to walk with you. I don't. I just know what I was doing. And, uh, I, you know, I, I didn't feel a change. I didn't feel nothing. I didn't get heavy chested. I didn't feel the Holy Spirit come in me, nothing. I just gave my life to Christ, and I started reading the Bible. I started attending the Bible studies in there and listening to the Word, and lo and behold, I was understanding the Word now. So it wasn't just something I was reading in the passages. 
Like, I will never leave you and never forsake you. I started understanding that, and my relationship grew. And I'm telling you, I was in an 8 by 10 by myself with about an hour a day out for some fo- fo- a few phone calls, a shower, and a little yard time, and right back locked up. So I got a lot of time in the Word. <clears throat> the pastor at this spot I was in used to come on Thursday and Sunday and sit with me, and we'd study the Word together. <clears throat> and I had a lot of alone time with the Lord. And that's where I credit everything. That was like I tell everybody, that was my time out. That was the Lord saying to me, we're going to cleanse you of the past. I forgive you now of all your sins, of course, because when we call on his name, he forgives us. But I'm going to teach you some stuff here. And you are here. So that was my time out. And I got, you know, and now <clears throat> I come home, fast forward to me coming home. Well, that's when the hard part starts again. I was going to say, I was going to say, how, so how old are you when you get out? I got out, I was uh, 2008, what are we at, Nick, 18, um, well, I was about 39, I believe. Okay. 38, 39, 39, and um, I come back out, I go right back downtown to the nightclubs because I told you so my- you really, like, your life has only been started like 13 years ago. Yeah, yeah, I'm home, what am I home now, right? Yeah, uh, 13, yeah, 13, 14 yeah. years. So I go right back to the nightclubs with my partner. So you're actually, you're younger. You're actually only 40 right now. Yeah, you're for like, sure. I'm preserved, bro. I'm yeah. preserved. And now that I'm not 300 pounds and I'm 220 pounds, yeah. everybody tells me, well, you look so young and youthful. I'm like, it's all that weight gone, right? Yeah. So I tell, you know, I was just 53. Obviously, yeah. you helped celebrate my birthday. So, um, <clears throat> so now I'm home. I'm back in the nightclubs, running the nightclubs, making my good money again in the whole nine yards. Everything changed as far as me in the motorcycle world, but the women stuff was still with me because I'm downtown, the nightclubs, girls, 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 girls. And I'm like, God, Lord, I, I, I can't do this. I'm, 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 I'm falling here. I need your help here. I don't, I don't want to do this no more, you know? And uh, be right before. Because it's easy, to, <clears throat> it's easy to go back to, and this is where I think know. people struggle is because it's easy to just go with what you know. It's harder <clears throat> to make something new. Yes, we don't know. It's it's we're, we're it's the unknown. You know, right. <clears throat> what am I going to do? I'm like, I don't want to do this. Well, I met little Mel, my wife Melissa, before I got indicted under Rico out here in Florida. I came out with a childhood friend of mine that was living out here, and he introduced me to her and some friends and everything. And we just looked at each other like friends. You know, I still was had girlfriends back then and everything. Nothing, you know. And uh, so then when I came home, he had a house down here and was living down here on the other coast in in, in Port Charlotte, Northport. And uh, I came to visit him in the house and, you know, seeing little Mel again. And, you know, she was in an eight-year relationship that wasn't going good for her. And she wanted to get out. Me and her started talking and stuff. And I said, well, if we end up dating, you got to come to Chicago. Because my dad had just passed. I was only home eight months and my dad passed. My dad was a very bad diabetic. So he passed at 76. He was very sick. My biggest fear was he was going to pass when I was in prison. But he hung tight. I got home. He made it eight months. He passed. I moved back into my childhood home with my mother because she didn't want to be there alone, and we had a big home, and I'm like, okay, Mom, I'm going to live right in the basement with you. I'm that guy living in his mom's basement, you know what I mean? <laughs> but making ten grand a month, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Just want to take care of my Italian mother that took care of me all my life, yeah. you know, and you know she died in my home here in yeah. Florida. I, you know, I moved her down here and stuff, so it was great. You know, the Lord blessed us with each other like that. So I told little Mel, you want to get together with me, you have to move to Chicago. I can't move out here. I need to be by my mom and, you know, take care of my business down here. For a period of time. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. And we did it for five years. But, um, you know, after five years of being home and the nightclubs and stuff, I finally said she wanted to buy a house in Florida. So we bought a house just for the, the we were going to be snowbirds just to get away so she could see her mom and dad down here. And Nick, I, I finally had to get out. It was like quicksand for me. Everything was coming back around me. I had guys coming in my office at the nightclub. Hey, brother. I get you a key for 18 grand. You know, they're going for 35 right now. It's so easy, right? It's so easy. So easy. Everybody was bringing me back. And I got what they were doing. They were trying to get me back on the come up. Let's get some stacks of money for Mel. He's our guy. And I appreciated that. You know, and that, and listen, I'm not going to, I'm not bragging on myself at all. You know, I'm not like that at all. But it shows my character. I was good to everybody. Yeah. I helped everybody out. You wanted to come to the nightclub. You want concert tickets. it's the same now. You do the same thing. It's just it doesn't have it doesn't involve cocaine. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? With the, with our core yeah, medical yeah. stuff, right. So you know everybody was coming, and I kept saying, "Guys, man, you can't do that to me, man. You're too, you're you're, you're enticing me. I can't do that." And that's what I say. I don't dip my foot in that old pool anymore because I will dive in. People are like, "Mel, you don't ride." Nope, haven't been on a motorcycle since so far. You missed it? Nah, because I relate. I I relate everything back riding with the motorcycle. Everything comes back to me. So. I don't want to get on a motorcycle and start riding, 
and all of a sudden I get bit by the bug, and then next thing I know I'm in a strip club, and then next thing I know I'm doing that, and that, and that, I, it could take me that quick. Right. So I tell everybody, I don't put my toe in the pool at all. And everybody's like, you it's got like one. an alcoholic, like, oh, I just want drink. Yes. And everybody says, oh, Mel, you got so much willpower. No, I don't have willpower. I just don't that's go why in I the stay, places. That's why I stay, I stay the fuck away yes, from it. Bro. Yeah. It's like, you bring me in McDonald's, I'm going to have a Big Mac, man. <laughs> yeah, I can't right. be in there. Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of what, you know, and, and my relationship with the Lord has been first and foremost in everything. Now I know why people say that, because when you don't want to let him down, and you have this, and you you know, listen, as people, we the world lets us down, right? People let us down. They, you know, look at all the guys that were going to ro- roll on me in the, in the grand yeah. jury. I was tight with them all. Godfather to some of the kids and stuff like that. But the, he's never going to let you down. So when I, you know, when things pop up in my mind and you know, there's these chicks over here looking at me and I'm, you know, they're starry eyed at me and I'm 53 years old and they're 28 years old. I'm like, okay, God, I know I'm not letting you down here. Whether it's my wife or not, I'm staying the path. You got me. Get me out of this situation, you know, and I can... Because it's about what you what you want out of your life. Yes, you, know, you got a second chance. Yes. So now it's like, yeah. What does what does that second chance look like? Yeah. And I don't want to be a hypocrite. I do. You know, I spent most of my life being that hypocrite with the Lord. You know, I was always the guy that I gave my word to. You. I was going to keep my word, and I don't care who watches this podcast. I know there's a lot of people that don't, you know, they ain't fond of me no more in life. I get it. Whatever. Oh, you're an actor, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 no, yeah, no. yeah. This yeah, is well, all this is all an act. We talked about this. So yeah, yeah. I'm home since 2008, and there's some people that really say to this day, he's full of shit. He didn't he's find the, the Lord. He's the same old Mel. He's the decep. <laughs> he's the master of deception. He's the same old guy. And my I'll, my friends will tell me they're like, and I go, guys, man, listen, how how funny is that? They're like, they don't know you. And I said, listen, if I'm pulling this off, living this lifestyle since 2008, I need to be the Rock. I yeah, need yeah, to be yeah. Dwayne in every every single movie because no better actor would be than that. You know what I mean? Please. Well, I saw something that you know, and I I kind of took it hard as it was. It's a funny thing, but it was basically like. There's still people talking about the old you because they have no access to the new you. Mm-hmm. You know mm. what I mean? I never heard that one. Yeah. That's pretty good. It's good, right? Because that's what they do. They, You know, people are talking about the old you, and then people change. You know, I haven't always been a good person. I've been a fuck-up, too. Yeah. I made some bad decisions. I've always been, haven't always been a good man. And people that know me of those situations, they know. Yeah. You know what I mean? But that doesn't, that's not me now. Right. You know what I mean? That was, it, and was that's a different what it version seems to be. Me. You know, listen, and I still listen. I don't ever talk bad about my old crew. I don't talk bad about my old friends. I got a lot of love for them guys still. Yeah. I just made a decision that they weren't comfortable with and not hurting anybody. And I left the club and a lot of people don't like that, you know, and I had to live my life. I wanted to live my life for my daughter and my grandbabies now and my wife and, and help and do what I'm supposed to be doing. So when were you able to, when you got out, were you able to like rekindle that relationship with your daughter? The first time when I came home in 2000, my daughter was still, you know, I think like when I went away, uh, well, she's 35 now. So when I went away with the Rico, I think she was like 16 or something like that. But the first time I did, and I told her, dad's done with all that. Yeah. It's me and you. I'm, you know, obviously she didn't have no kids on. I said, we're going to do this. The morning they kicked my doors in for that Rico, my daughter was, they did it at, at, at 545. At eight o'clock, my daughter went to go to the restaurant to meet me, to have breakfast with me. And uh, my mother called her and said, come to our house. She said, they just uh, kicked Kathy's doors in and took your dad. So my daughter was mad, you know. He said he'd never leave again, but it was for, I was paying the price for the old school yeah, stuff. Yeah. When I pled, I was pleading the stuff in the nineties, and so I she was it. mad at you. She was mad. She thought I for did some stuff, and well, until she until we, she understood it, uh-huh. and I told her her name's Danielle. I said, "D, this ain't no new indictment. I'm gonna plead the stuff I did in the nineties. My predicate acts stop in 1998 because that's when I went to prison. So my predicate acts under the RICO were no more after 98 because I wasn't around the club." where the other three members still had predicate acts in 2001 and two and three mine stopped because I was gone. So she understood it and stuff. So then when I came home from the Rico, she had just had my oldest granddaughter. Now who's yeah. going to be 15. And then <clears throat> I started, you got another one. Too. Yeah, I got another yeah. one. That's with us down here. So my daughter moved down here about a year and a half ago. And I, uh, the youngest grandbaby is down here. The, our, my oldest granddaughter is splits her time between her dad and here. Cause she didn't want to leave the school. How fucking thankful <clears throat> are you, man, man, unbelievable. I just, uh, that's After all that you get a relationship with her, your yes. grandkids. Yes. You got Mel. Like, yeah, that's why I'm so many times through the day when I do my devotionals, as you see in the morning yeah, yeah, and stuff course. like that, yeah. people are like, Mel, man, you know, we can see how grateful we are, we are, how thankful I said, man, I don't, you know, 
I, t- I tell people, when you're in prayer, you don't have to get down on your knees every time. I do it in the morning, do it at nighttime. But I'll be praying. Prayer is a state of mind, right? I'll be in situations where we're in our core medical meetings and stuff, or I'm running, you know, helping with the IFBB and NPC. Everybody don't have the memo like us. Everybody's not the best person. So, you know, sometimes they know I'm a Christian and they start talking a little bit out of line and I'll be right talking in my head and I'll be like, okay, Lord, you got me here. Guide me through this. You didn't bring me this far to split this dude's head open and go into a, <laughs> going back into a prison. So, guy, you know, <clears throat> we say a funny thing is we say, uh, I, you know, we know this other guy don't believe in the Lord, but I'd like to tell him, like, only because of the Lord, you're getting, you're, you're, you've got to pass right now in life, yeah. you know, because he's not bringing me back there. So, um, so it's such a huge blessing, and I'm, I give, I'm so thankful for what I'm doing, and I'm thankful for, for that he stepped into my life, and I gave my heart to him, and, 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 and he controls everything. So you, so in 2008, you get out. Um, you're, you're up there for another five years doing nightclub stuff, yes. right? And then you came down here. I came down here, yeah. We bought the house and stuff. So we so that's like uh, 2014. 2014. We bought the house okay. in April. And then all of a sudden, at the end of 2014, the opportunity comes up to buy the gym, which was an oh, old gold's right. gym, yeah, yeah, yeah. achieve. Big place, right? Big place, 14,000 square foot. Yeah. I tell my wife, babe, I don't want a gym. I said, I don't know, there's no money in a mile pod gym, and I don't want to be there. Oh, babe, this would be perfect. We could move down there. I could run the gym. You just need an airport. You can travel because I was doing the bodybuilding stuff. Yeah. So you were at this point. You were already linked up with the NPC. I Matt was already Manning. linked up okay. with with Jim Manning and the NPC. Oh, cool. I, I, yeah. I linked so up. So that's with, really where you were making your money at yes, the time. Yeah. Yes, I linked okay. up with Jim Manning. Jim Manning in in two thousand and um, nine at a show in Chicago. We met through some friends, and I always knew who he was because he was the, he's the pioneer of the bodybuilding. You know, yeah, so I always knew yeah. who Jim Manning was, of course. You know, and I was a, a fan of what he was doing for all this sport. And we became dear friends, you know, and then I started, you know, traveling in the industry with him. And then I moved down here and bought the gym. We bought the gym. My wife talked me into buying a gym. We bought the gym. We called it Second Chance after my moniker. Yeah, that yeah. became my moniker. It's still you know? the name of the gym, right? It's still the name. Yeah, yeah they yeah. bought it. Yeah, a company bought it and it's still the name. And um, <clears throat> and then Jim was like, all right, Mel, you're in Florida. He's like, you know, you're right where you're at in Port Charlotte, Punta Gorda. They, they can use a show. Come on. You're my guy. Let me give you a sanction. Start your own show. We started the Mel Chancy. I had a partner come in to help me run it because I didn't know what I was doing with the promotions of the shows and the expedite and stuff like that. <clears throat> and that was, um, I threw my first show in 2016. How many shows do you now do? Now I have three. Three a year. Through the year here. April, August, and December. Uh, the December show, the Holiday Classic, became the biggest show in the yeah. state of Florida uh, with yeah, the number you're, wise. You're, wow. You're locked down during that time. Man, bro, that yeah. show just, just took off. And, I mean, it's amazing. The, the competitors that are competing in the first week before Christmas – you know, and uh, it's just it's just it's just a blessing. And you know what? And they see the passion I have for them and what we do for the athletes and the the give back I have, and which and, makes sense. And it, your you know. shows are kind of like an on ramp to the pros, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're a national qualifier to get to the national level. You win the, at the national level, you turn pro. It's called national qualifiers. And uh, you know, now here we are in 2022. And I'm helping Jim <laughs> oversee everything and, and, and being with my guy, Steve Weinberger, and his, his grandson, Tyler Mannion. And it's just, we, I, I became family to everybody and them to me. It's been an amazing journey to throw in my three shows. My wife is my partner now on the shows, yeah. and she takes care of the whole She's back. the boss. Man. She's the boss, right? Yeah. She does it. She got it to where That's I can. A, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and note there right there because of, you know, my, my wife as well. Like, yes. man, we just, people don't understand. You just can't be successful without a good woman by your side to truth i mean it really is like i mean i i I see the way you guys run and you couldn't do a quarter of the things that you do without her and i'm the same way like there's just no way man she's on the phones with these hotels getting the rooms book we're booking a hundred rooms a night for two nights you know taking that sometimes i'm wondering like what what am i even doing yeah (laughs) yeah i'm just talking listen i'll be traveling and i'll see the athletes and they'll be like hey uh hey what's the what's the uh, date for the December show in 2022 now? And I'm like, I don't know. And they look at me and they're like, I go, we got to ask little Mel, you know, <laughs> she got it down to where I can literally come in and do what I do. And yeah, that's yeah, yeah. to be with the athletes. Yeah. I love to talk to the athletes. I love to be with them. I love then when I get, when I, when I open up the night show and I get off the stage and rile the crowd up and get the crowd loosened up, I go, right. I spend all the time with my sponsors at their booths and everything. I take pictures with everybody. And then I go meet the families. 
I spend all that time with everybody, and th- that goes so far. And, you know, they feel it for me. I'm not just doing it because, uh, let me go talk to their families because it's the right thing to do. I do it because I love doing it, and I want to find out what this person's journey was and what that person's journey was, you know. And uh, so, so how does this, I mean, I can mentally, I can tie it in, but for you, how did it tie in with uh, with the hormones and, with, and we'll start working with core? So, I years a year years ago. I've been with Sid almost five years, so with Core Medical. But years before that, I was with another company out of Tampa. So I learned, you know, the the hormone. I knew the hormone replacement game, of course. What did I do with hormones all my life? So I knew the the the, the, the medical side of it. I got with the business, and that didn't work out. I didn't just just it wasn't a connect for me with that company. <clears throat> so I stayed out of it for a little bit. Me and Sydney hooked up with each other with core medical and uh it was just a perfect fit just it's the same story as you you came over here you were a perfect fit we all jived in and it was great for us and so how this works with me with core medical is with both businesses it's hand in hand because you know i'm getting ready to leave thursday for the arnold classic you know so i'm at these big bodybuilding shows the olympia everybody knows who i am with what i do for jim Mannion, and then i became a you know with the promoting side so everybody knows so they're lined up to talk to me take pictures with me and stuff and they're like hey we need to talk to you about core here. Here's my phone number. Call me when I get home. I can't, I don't have no time today, but call me when I get home. So it's like, I'm so, I say, I'm so blessed. Both businesses just in tie with each other and go hand in hand. And I bring so many patients in from the IFBB NPC world that need hormone replacement. <clears throat> that guys my age that need hormone replacement, because you know, a lot of times they've, they, a lot of times this, I think that you, you explain it to me is because from old stuff and being on bad gear and being on, but like, screwed their they're screwed yes their their fshl shut down the whole nine yards you know so i get to take the time to talk to them people so and then we get them off our social media the patients that come in and see what we do and stuff so you know it goes hand in hand with me and you you know you being a you know ex-military and a veteran and stuff you bring the veterans they come and see your changes and stuff so that's the blessing i'm like man lord i get to travel around i get to interact with people which i love to do I get to give the give back. I tell them about the hormones or they're talking to me about the bodybuilding shows. I'm like, it's such a blessing that I get to have so much fun and do what I do and love it. So on the veteran stuff, you're (laughs) very passionate about working with vets and, and, and talking to those guys and helping them out. Yeah. So, uh, what, how did that happen? So everybody in my family was, is a veteran besides me. My dad was in the Korean war. Uh, his brother was, you know, Vietnam, you know, my cousins were in Afghanistan. And I mean, I'm talking about, I only have two sisters in my immediate family, but my cousins and my yeah, yeah. dad's brothers and stuff. It was a, it was a, it was a military uh, um, life for everybody, you know, but I d- didn't go that way. I went, joined the motorcycle club. So I was always into military stuff. I was always watching my cousins get new decorations and stuff and seeing them. My one cousin spent 40 years, made a career out of it as he became colonel and stuff like that, teaching, you yeah. know, for the Marines and stuff like that. So I knew all that. So when I had the chance to, you know, when I was at CORE, before you came on, um, I hooked up with with this friend of mine, Melissa Jarbo, and her husband got killed in Afghanistan. And she's like, Mel, I, I want to push this thing through Washington. We're military veterans project. Well, to get into it, as you know, as we talked about, the, v, the VA and everything is not hip to getting you guys no. <laughs> with hormones, you know. And, it's just, and, the, and, the rea- and I'm, and, and I'm kind of hard on them, but, you know, the reality is, is they're pushing um, SSRIs and it, it's a big, it's a big government and pharmaceutical, you know, game. Um, and testosterone doesn't play into that, yeah. that picture. <clears> and I always let you say it cause I don't want to ever bad rep the VA or anything like that. Cause I'll I smash, didn't serve. I'll smash the shit out of Yeah. You, there. yeah. I always, if you guys ever see me and Nick and stuff like that, I let Nick go there because I can't do it. I don't know it. I didn't serve, but I do know what I know. And I was yeah. bringing veterans in and before Nick came on, and I was, we were trying to help him. So Sydney was, we were bringing him in and just, Sydney was really coming out of pocket, yeah. bringing these guys in and testing them and stuff like that, trying to get this thing going. Well, couldn't go through Washington because there's too many, too many obstacles, too many ladders, the steps to climb and everything like that. So Sid and myself said, let's do it on our own. Yeah. Let's offer the veterans a, 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 a cheaper price, cheaper price with medications. We'll get them in for the cheapest blood work we can and, yeah. and we'll do this. 
and we'll sing it from the mountaintops and, and, and we'll and, see. And for the people that don't really understand the reasons why I tell them, like, just go with core because this is what happens. Sure, you can you can get the VA to, and I'm going to make a video separately, but you can get the VA to give you testosterone, but you're going to fight for them for two years. You're going to literally have to fight for two years, yep. um, argue back and forth, you know, go through a million different people. Maybe you get an endocrinologist, maybe you don't. Um, at the end of the day, it's two years. And then what they have, they'll, they'll finally cave and go, all right, fine give you some testosterone but that's it they're going to give yeah. you a little dose um one guy i know a bunch of people are getting like 25 mil i was telling you that yeah. 25 milligrams every three weeks oh, it's like, crazy. and that ju- you're actually messing you up worse, worse because yeah. now you're crashing yeah you know you're you get you're gonna feel great for like a couple seconds yeah so that's it and then you know two days later you're you're crashing again and you know they're not giving you any acg they're not giving you anything else yeah any, any um, answers i tell everybody the worst thing you do with your hormones is just, play the roller coaster yeah ride. exactly don't even start don't know? even start yeah so yeah. i said skip all the bs get, save yourself two years of headache and you know quit you know stop buying starbucks you know mocha choke of bullshit yeah, for, yeah, for yeah. a month yeah. uh, and, and and put that 35 dollars a week towards Make, right. Because, I mean, because, you know, like, you'll make more money. You'll have better relationships. you have a better, higher quality of life. They're like, what's the side effects? I don't know. A good fucking yeah, life. Yeah, good life. <laughs> a good it life. That's the side effects. Changes the game. And yeah. then, you know, and we started doing that. And then I knew so many military people, the Blackwater guys and everything. And then yeah. once they heard and one person told one person and person told another person, and then you came along. You know, you found, found us through a friend, I think. Yeah, of, through right, Rocco. Through yeah. Rocco. Through yeah. right, 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 Rocco. And then you came aboard. And then, you know, me and Sid, we had a thing, me and Sid, because, you know, everybody was coming to us like, oh, I, got, I can do this. I can bring you 300 patients a month. And I tell Sid, okay, don't, don't pay them yet. Yeah, don't do anything. Let them, let them do it. Let's see what they got. That's what you did with me. You know how hard yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Come on, it's yeah. not easy to do yeah. it. You, you have to have a natch. You but have to have a That was the following. thing. It's like I had, I had people that were like, they were chomping at the bit because they needed support. They needed someone who knew what they were doing to actually give a shit about them. And, and, Plus, and, you put your story out to the world. Yeah, and I told them my own. You know, I got very vulnerable and told them my own stuff. It's you know the best. I mean? Being, you know, coming on, being off with yeah. having a kid and everything. Yeah. And, and Your story's the best because you were honest with everybody, and then they see the way you're oh, I feeling. Would, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't have the life that I have right now no. without it. I would be like transformation a, you yeah. made in your body, yeah, not exactly. only physical, mentally and yeah. your wife and your child and everything changed for you. So you have that following from the military that gets with you now. You bring in a huge amount of patience. So I look at Sid and I'm like, wow, we're five years later, man. Look at what core is doing now. Like I nationally. never thought, yes, nationally, the yeah. company just grew and expanded and stuff. Yeah. And me and you, and you know, we have other people, Rocco that bring them in, you know, we're not taking all the credit by no means, but we have a great team that believes in what they're doing. Do you, and, know you know what's cool is, uh, um, our, our, our David black, um, they got a lot of guys who call core. You'll talk to David or, um, Travis, mm-hmm. our intake um, guys. But dude, he like he was telling me he's like he damn near in tears when he's talking about like some of these guys that are calling him. He's like, man, I just love my job so much. I get to talk to these guys and like change their life for the better and listen to them talk about one the hardships that they're going through. Yeah, and then yeah. how and then how this yeah. has helped them. Mm. And uh, and from a you know, and he's one of the onboarding specialists and, for and core. intake. Yeah, we have and such he, a great team. And he loves his job. He's working like twelve hours a day talking to these guys, and he yeah. loves his job because he can hear the. You can hear them, you know, on the phone going and yeah. how their life is changing. And it's just cool to see from their aspect, yes. from an employee's aspect, seeing them of like appreciate how them. thankful he is for his yeah. job because he just gets to help people. And I love when the when the, my patients hit me back up after they got inboarded and, and they're on and they say, hey, listen, Mel, uh, Mike Arrow, Matt Stevens, the patient coordinators, these guys are great, man. They take yeah. their time with me. We're not just, you know, we're not just a money sign to them. They're very great. And, and I'm going to brag on the team. We have yeah. an amazing team because they know. That's why I laugh. Yeah, go ahead. They know yeah. that if we're bringing patients and Nick and myself, we expect that patient to be treated oh, amazingly. Of like a human being. Like a human being amazingly yeah. because we are going to get, they're going to tell their family members and they're going to tell their friends and the referrals and the referrals, I, but everybody better be treated I, right. I laugh because sometimes we, you know, we'll post a video and somebody will put some stupid, hateful comment like, oh, this is snake oil, blah, 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 blah. And I just laugh because I'm like, oh, you obviously you don't know. And then there's like 20 comments below like, well, actually changed my life you <laughs> yeah. know what i mean my my relationship with my wife is better yeah um it's yeah. just funny but you know it, it's just so cool to be in our position to do this yeah. and help it's the give back for me i love i was helping everybody in the gyms back in the day hey knucklehead get off all that gear you don't need to be on seven different components right now get off all that get off this get off the anadrol i was helping them just for free because i didn't want to see nobody hurt themselves 
I was fortunate enough to have doctors in my background back in the day yeah. that were telling me, you know, don't kill yourself over this. You, get, you know, so I was giving back before we got with Corey. Then I got with Corey, and I was like, now I can do this, make a paycheck from this, a living, yeah. and 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 give out the great advice and hook them with the, with with a great team of doctors, a great company, the pharmacies. It's just so great. We didn't have this back in my day. This would have been amazing back then. You couldn't get no blood work and. All this I mean, stuff. even even when I got out, it was more difficult. Mm-hmm. When I got out in 2012, there was you know I had, I had to see a guy in Kansas City mm-hmm. um, to, to to go to get it done. Yeah, and obviously that didn't work out, and that's where he's won with Core now. But, yeah, and you, um, you know I'm going to give you your props. You've been a great ad addition here. How long have you been with us, Nick? Uh, almost three years. Yeah, you've yeah. been great. I mean, it's been great. You know, you three fit years. right in and. Your family to us. You're always yeah. over here with us, you yeah. know. And we make you come here. We're I'm like, a, I'm a, I'm a Florida. Boy. I'm actually, you know, I remember I was born you were here. Born here, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like now that I, now that I'm getting older, and, and Florida, Florida's gonna be home here yeah. soon. We make Nick come uh, to us, you guys, because we, to get to him in North Carolina, we got to do layovers <laughs> <laughs> in Atlanta, and we're not. I fly so much. I don't want to layover. We do layovers, so we're like, hey, so I go sit, get Nick down here. It's I nice out. Get him down here. Give jo- him. Johnny and I are talking about getting our pilot's license so we can just fly direct. <laughs> that would be you know, great for the next two years. Like I flew here yeah. on a little puddle yeah. jumper it was great 40 minutes in the air from my coast I to think, here i think we did the time i think it's like four hours you know yeah. from wilmington to the boca is like four hours yeah. and our, if we do our own plane yeah yeah so that's perfect. what we're gonna have to that's, uh, that's that's the that's the goal for 2022 pilot's license and start flying around wherever we want to go and here we are 2022 forget down. delta forget yeah, forget, forget all delta yeah, and all yeah. that other stuff they're done <laughs> and here we are in 2022 sitting down and having some fun on some yeah. podcast and stuff like so what's that, next you know? man what's next for mel so, you know, the season starts for me to Thursday with the Arnold Classic for the weekend. That opens up my, my season. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and let the cat out of the bag because a lot of people know what I'm doing. So I am. we are about ready to start filming very soon for my life story, my documentary. And uh, that's going to be done by... Dwayne Johnson, The Rock so himself. Right? Have you As told you know, anybody yet? I did a little bit on the one podcast I did with Chris Cavallini. He brought it yeah, out, yeah. and we just talked a little bit about it. But it's, it's right here. So um, we have a guy by the name of Billy Corbin who did uh-huh. Cocaine Cowboys and Screwballs, and he's a, an amazing, amazing documentary guy. That's who's doing the documentary. We got John Bernthal, the Punisher, uh-huh. who happens to be Sid Gordon's brother-in-law, brother-in-law here from right. Cora, our owner yeah, yeah, yeah. of Cora. It's his brother-in-law. And, the um, Punisher. The Punisher. <laughs> he is going to be part of the production team for the documentary. So the first thing is the documentary that, you know, will be aired like on a Netflix or a Paramount, whoever. We don't know we, yet. We don't know that yeah. part yet. Whoever decides to buy the project. And, right. you know, but working with Dwayne and Seven Buck Production Company, I mean, that's the I mean, death. It's, it's, green, it's greenlit. It's happening. That's, it's ha- it's yeah. happening. Yeah, we're right there. We're, we're doing it right now. Everybody's got. So Billy's aboard. John's aboard. And then John is actually going to play my life he's going to play me in the scripted series so did first you tell, did you tell john he has to gain like 100 pounds well that's the that that's the funny story right now is because we're gonna he's looking forward to so he's a method actor so when he after the documentary is up and running as Dwayne says hey i want to i want to give the world an eight ounce filet so they're yeah. chomping at the bit to buy the cow john, we want to do a series you know like the sun's anarchy the scripted series like yeah. that john's going to play you and your life story so John's a method actor. So when he plays somebody, he's coming with them. He's going to, yeah. he said, I'm going to live at your house for two, three months, get to know you. I'm going to get to know road back in the day, get in your mind and everything. And you're going to put some weight on me. So Dwayne was laughing. We were all on a Zoom call and Dwayne goes, well, we're, we're not getting you to 290. And we're like, no, that's not happening. Right. But he's so lean and muscular. Now, yeah. John is, you put 15 pounds on he's him gonna and look throw big. him on a stay on a yeah. set. Yeah. He's going to look huge. Yeah. So I think we're more excited about training, training him and getting him all jacked, jacked up, up a little bit than, you know, the show itself. So he's so, going to have to eat. I don't, he don't eat that much. No, he don't eat. You he's going to have so to into his yeah. thing. Yeah. But he's going to, cause he's going to be living with me. So he's going to be training with me and I'm going to make him eat and, you know, <laughs> and, uh, fun, and so man. it's going to be cool. So we've been, it's been cool. We've been doing this for almost just about three years, you know, with the, with the story and getting the story together and, you know, the, the, the retired ATF agent's going to have a big part of it because we remained friends after that, the guy that was oh, chasing right. me around. I actually around. did a uh, podcast with uh, Boots and uh, was it Boots and Sal. Lou, yeah, Lou. Yeah, Lou. yeah Veloza, yeah, 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 yeah you yeah. did their podcast. So yeah. these guys that were chasing me around for 15 years, and, and you know, no hard feelings. We were friends to this yeah, day. Yeah. So he's got a big, that's the whole. So, you know, when Dwayne, we started talking about this, doing the project, you know, everybody wants to hear the old motorcycle stories. That's great. But the, Dwayne's like, this is the redemption story of you, bro. Where you're at now. The second chance. That's what, that's, second that's chance. really the story. Yes. Yeah. And, the, and coming from a guy like him, he's like, Mel, you're an inspiration, not only to myself, 
you know, my, my third year friend, Terry Bollea, Hulk Hogan. And, you know, I know all the wrestlers and, and, you know, I, I walked in a lot of different arenas in life, so to say, you know, I mean, I've, you know, been around a lot of different people in life and, uh, they're like to see where you were and to see you now and to see how you talk about the love you have for the Lord and your family and what you're doing is an inspiration to us all. So Dwayne's like this documentary is 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 going to be about the redemption and where you're at today. Yeah, we'll talk about the great stories of the motorcycle world and all that stuff. It's great, but this is what we're the, the world's going to take out of it when they come out of it. You yeah. know, because I had book companies coming to me. You know, from the for in the last you know. 10, 12, 13 years, I had A&E coming at me, wanted to do reality series with me hunting ghosts. Uh, you name it, I, they've been coming at me. I'm too lazy to go write a book and do a book signing tour. I don't want to be on the road anymore, you know. So thank the Lord that I passed all that stuff up because had I did something, then Dwayne wouldn't, the Seven Bucks right. crew wouldn't have been able to tell the story the way they're telling it. Yeah. So it was his timing, right? He put it in my heart. You know, my wife's like, well, baby, if you want to do the book with the New York company, they're offering you $150,000 signing bonus, two bucks a book, a million copies, a bestseller. We'll get a big Winnebago and we'll travel around with the dogs. I go, stop. I'm not driving in no Winnebago and doing no book signing tours in every state in, in, in the world. Stop it. They, they'd have to give me a hundred million. Then I'll you wouldn't sit. be able to sit by your pool every That's day. That's what I'm saying. I want to sit in the pool, right? I'm not trying to do that. So thank God that what'd I. You tell, what'd you tell Johnny last night? You were talking about uh, the one thing you missed uh, being locked up was uh, sunsets and, and. Suns, you don't see the night. You know, night, you know, if you're at, in, out in the evening yard and everything, the minute that sun starts going down, you're they in. Take they, you in. They ain't letting us out that nighttime. <laughs> you're in, you're locked up. Just taking a shower without any shower shoes. You're putting the flips on to get in the showers, right? I mean, yeah. Listen, the prison showers are clean. You got people that are cleaning them, you know. Prisons are clean, you know. But still, you ain't getting in the shower without any shower shoes and then seeing the nighttime sunsets and just the little stuff, you know. That's what it's about. I remember in one of the prisons, we were about 10 of us. We were in this yard holding facility, and I'm laying on the ground, and there's a big, you know, 15-foot wall, and on top is just a, a, a big steel cage, but that you can see through big slats like a fence thing. And I'm looking at the stars and everything, and guys are doing laps of cardio around a... 25 by 25 area and i go hey boys and they go what's up big mel and i go man this shit sure wasn't in the brochure huh and they started cracking up and they're like no it wasn't and i'm like damn if they would have told us this part of it we might not have been criminals back in the day yeah, you know yeah. we're watching out we're looking out the window we're seeing construction companies working on the street and i'm like boy i'd pay to be out there right now i'd pay them to be pouring concrete right you know That's what i mean crazy perception man perception so it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm very grateful and humbled, especially with having The Rock, you know, that was interested and we yeah. became friends. We met each other a handful of years ago and he knew my story. You know, of course, Hulk was really good friends with his dad and I met Dwayne in the rest back in the wrestling scene and I was, you know, Hulk was trying to get me into WCW to become a wrestler back in the day. But as I tell the story, you know, I didn't want no legal gig. I didn't want a gig where I had to be part of something where you I didn't want a, no job. I didn't want a job. Yeah. I didn't care what it paid. I was making very good money as running the club was with my own little stuff I was doing. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to punch a clock and everybody used to say this this kid, you know, Hulk, you're going to bring him in. You're, you're going to roll the red carpet out for him. It's probably going to be the heavyweight champ one day if he can learn how to wrestle pretty good. And you show him the ropes. And uh, my friend used to tell him, man, man, Mel's kind of a different dude. You throw some illegal stuff at him, he'll take it. But anything <laughs> legal, he don't want to get involved in no businesses and stuff. And now we laugh because he lives an hour and a half from me in Clearwater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm with him a lot, as you see. I'm with yeah. Terry a lot. And at 53, I got my aches and pains from the body bill and the torn tendons and pecs and everything like that. But all them guys that spent that career wrestling, they're, they're pretty beat up, right? Let's busted. be honest. They're yeah. beat up. So he tells me one time we're on the boat, we're having some cocktails, laughing and joking. He goes to my wife, he goes, yeah, little Mel, I'm glad Mel didn't take that wrestling path. And he goes, I'm glad he went to prison. And I looked and I go, yeah, me too, by the way. You know what I mean? Like it saved my body from uh, walking. So, uh, so yeah, getting back to the Dwayne thing. So that's, that's right now, right here. So the next step right here in March is the beginning of March we're at is to they're shop it out to to their buyers that's all awesome, that's man. who becomes the buyer you know i'm so, so excited yeah let's say the netflix and netflix is it seems like it's going to be the best fit because billy corbin does all the big you know the documentaries yeah. he hits the home runs over there with all his stuff Dwayne just did red notice yeah seven bucks team did red notice biggest movie ever so they've over got there. A, they got a good relationship johnny bernthal yeah. is you know his is, is a superstar right now yeah. he's got such a good such a good uh rapport 
in in his field over there. I mean, he's a great actor, as you see. He's eventually, up. I'm gonna get his, I'm gonna get his butt on this podcast. Well, eventually. he started his own. You see I'm that not, he just good. started his own. It's yeah, good. Yeah. yeah. So John's into that too. So maybe we'll go over there. You know, yeah. but. Uh, so that's uh, I'm excited for that, and um, you know, as I tell everybody, I told I told Dwayne, I told The Rock, and I told you know my my attorney that's looking over all this for me. I told Hulk, told Terry, told my wife, I'm ready to do whatever comes down the pike for me here. Um, yeah. Whatever comes down, whatever God's opening, whatever doors He's opening for me up, I'm not going to be lazy. I'm going to be doing this. And I said, and they're like, man, you got a lot of energy for this, a lot of spunk. And I said, well, when you didn't get your first real your first credit card till you were forty. And your first really legit job. Yeah, I poured some concrete when I was younger, but like I said, it yeah. was a legit job. But then I got off the radar for all yeah. them years. Now I'm going to be rolling with it. I said, you know, as my friends will be 60-something years old and retiring, I'll be on the walk or going through the airport still, you know, making a living. So it's kind of a funny thing we have in the house. But uh, I'm ready for it. You know, it's like it's, 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 it's a huge. And I know what the doors. I see the platform that. God is allowing me to have, you know, just from my devotionals in the morning, I see what's growing and I see the people that come to this platform and it's in, in, in what I call myself and it's dummy down individuals like myself, gangsters, motorcycle members, street people that are finding the Lord and they're seeing my devotionals and they're like, God, Mel, you, you're really so strong.